WP. All right, great. Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Festa. Um, I am the vice chair of a group called 3D Commerce, which is part of the Kronos Group. We basically you know, get together, discuss, build roadmaps, try to figure out the challenges that you know, the e-commerce industry is facing, specifically in 3D. And then we work closely with the 3D Formats Group to help communicate you know, ideas and technologies and challenges that we're having to try to essentially elevate you know, 3D Commerce, take it to the next level, utilize all the great tools that the uh, Kronos Group has and supports. And yeah, today I'm excited about our panel. We're gonna be just be talking about, in general, leveling up 3D commerce. The idea is essentially that, you know, today there's, you know, web viewers and 3D is kind of in the image tray and we're starting to see it a little bit more here and there, but it hasn't really, you know, taken off in the way that we're all waiting for. And I think AWE is a great conference to be at and to see, you know, the future of these headsets and people interacting with mixed reality. And it's really exciting. But taking a step back to where the customer is today uh, on the e-commerce side, we're trying to essentially level them up. And GLTF is a great technology to allow us to create content once, build it and deploy it in a lot of places, and essentially use some of the new cutting edge features in some of the you know, PBR Next workflow that you might hear about in order to basically make the product as realistic as possible giving customers that extra bit of information and informed decision before they make a, pro uh, a purchase. So with that being said, I'm gonna introduce our great team of panelists. Come on up and <laughs> Yeah. Right. And let me just advance the slide. I believe there's a button up here. <laughs> There we go. All right. And, and you like, oh, you got one. Yeah. All right, good. Great. All right. So we'll get our, our pictures up here for you guys all to see. But I'm going to let each of our panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their background. I didn't really give my background. Apologies. Um, <laughs> I used to be at Wayfair, so that's kind of how I got into all this e-commerce stuff. Uh, I started a startup called 3XR, which we were doing 3D content production. I'm now working at Super DNA 3D Labs uh, with our CEO Jatinder, who's in the audience, and yeah, we're just helping kind of supporting the mission of creating content and distributing it, getting it out there for all these awesome uh, commercial opportunities. But with that, let me pass it over to Ashley. Cool. Uh, I'm Ashley Crowder. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ventana. We're a 3D content management system. Makes it easy to manage and deploy 3D at scale for clients like Hugo Boss, Diesel to Kohler. Um, I've been working in the 3D space for about 10 years, started out doing uh, you know, various interactive mixed reality experiences for brands, which is where I was painfully aware of this 3D asset problem, <laughs> and so really excited about everything Kronos is doing to make uh, our lives easier. So thanks, Ashley. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Daniel Frith. I'm Vice President of 3D at a company called Avatar. Uh, we develop 3D solutions and AI-based and machine learning-based technologies, especially around neural radiance fields. Uh, me, myself, I started in 3D in about 92. I uh, worked in flight simulation, worked in games for many years. Um, I ran 3D for IKEA with some great people, like, from, like Martin Entered is in the audience somewhere, uh, for about four years. And then uh, a year and a half ago, I moved over to Avatar. Um, excited to be here. Really, uh, sorry, also, I'm... Vice Chair of GLTF 3D Formats Working Group in Kronos, um, and work very closely with Mike in the 3D Commerce Group as well. Over to you. Hi, I'm Amra. I am the CEO co-founder of All3D. Interestingly enough, I think I'm an infant when it comes to 3D compared to you two. I started in 3D in uh, 2016. I was the Chief Product Officer of a startup that was doing interior design for consumers, and we got to um, figured this out very quickly. Once a consumer saw their room in 3D with new products, the conversion rate went up tremendously and they would buy all those products. Then we ended up at a retailer, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, the famous Bed Bath & Beyond that you all know mm -hmm. is going through bankruptcy right now. I was their head of innovations and I learned about the problems that retailers face when it comes to photography, how they deal with suppliers and the rest. So I left in two weeks before the world shut down um, due to COVID, started my company called All3D. And so it's been an interesting journey throughout. 
And there are some familiar faces in the audience. Hi, Leonard, and hi, Jatinder from Kronos Group. I am so glad to be part of this um, exciting group of deciding how e-commerce or visualization for e-commerce is going to happen in the next 10 years. We're there, but it, there's still a long way to go to do really 3D across all sellers and, and you know, creators of products and, um, for e-commerce. Excellent. Well, thank you all. So, quick round of applause for our team right here. And we're going to jump into just kind of a quick little sizzle reel. Uh, thank you, Dan, for helping put this together. So, the hope is that our, our Snap AV team over there can uh, go ahead and throw a video up for us. But what we're going to see is uh, real-world examples of content in action. Nice. Well, so that's some, you know, real world examples of GLTF in action. And, you know, I think it's pretty cool. Like we've come a long way, um, you know, as far as delivering web-based 3D. But I am going to open up a question to you, Dan, because we discussed this as we were putting together, you know, some of this content in the video. Is it enough? Are we at a point where, you know, the fidelity and the quality of the 3D content is there? Are we ready, you know, for consumers? Are consumers ready for it to believe it's a real product? So, Wow, that's, good. Uh, that's a big question. Um, I still think there's more we can do. I mean, photorealism gets better each year. I think the engines and platforms that are developed to take a really good format like GLTF and move it forward with all the extension work that's done in PBR is really bringing that along. There's some really good working groups going around physics and interactivity, which is kind of taking it further and further. Um, but I think there's always work that can be done. I think that there are some experiences that are created that are just exceptional and you know and i think people should use the power of gltf to really use that to its best of its ability and i think it's evolving so mm -hmm. yeah and then kind of ashley to you because we had talked too about you know is it there yet there's these technologies that we've seen in this video that aren't necessarily on the web and the question that we we're having is like you know is it ready is it there are people using it and you seem to think yes but i'll let you explain yeah look i mean i, I think some assets are better than others and it's you know, we talk about this a lot, it's like garbage in, garbage out. Like, you, you know, if you have a beautiful material library that's consistent with your new organization, you probably get better looking GLTF files. 
Um, but what's interesting is like, even if it's not exact, it still helps drive value to that consumer. Um, I just like gave a talk, so sorry if some of you already heard this, but we had a client use 3D on their e-commerce site and they were tracking, um, we track all the data, so they, were, they realized that majority of consumers were zooming in to a certain part of the product that they didn't have good photography of. Um, and so it actually changed their, the way they photograph all of their t-shirts uh, because they realized that everyone was zooming in really closely to these like three buttons and this logo um, on all the shirts. And, and so you know, it was providing consumers huge value and the survey said like 70% of them it helped them make their, confidently make that purchase even though the t-shirt didn't look 100% real exactly like the photo, right? So, um, you know, and, and yeah, GLTF, I think, does have a, a long way to go, right? We still need to figure out fur. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got a lot of fashion clients <laughs> yeah. who keep asking about fur, and I'm like, well, <laughs> it's coming. Yeah, I can um, imagine, like, in your space, there's also things about, you know, the try-on and the, you know, movement of the material and everything that's, you know, getting there, but still, we have ways to go. Yeah, yeah. For sure, the physics of fabric uh, is really important, and you know when you design in programs like Clo and Browseware, people are adding in the physics there. It's, but it's not perfect, um, you know. But and then you really can't export that out into GLTF. So one day, mm -hmm. one day, exactly. <laughs> um, but speaking of photography, Amra, like, what do you think of the state of you know 3D content? Is it good enough now to replace photography forever? We've been seeing this as a trend. But I feel like it always kind of keeps coming back and, and forth. So what are your thoughts? So Mike, as I said, I've been doing this for now six years plus. I'll tell you, it is really good at this point. Mm -hmm. So you can show to a consumer, even someone who's a photographer, um, an artist, and the, the results are, are pretty good. So replacing traditional photo studios with virtual studio and software is it's, 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 it's at par today. And, and we've had customers who are very finicky and particular about um, photography, they are converting. So think of 3D assets today for e-commerce where the web is 2D. So you're doing everything in 3D using PBR um, materials. You, you're still actually baking lighting. Even with a, a web viewer, you can get high quality photorealistic experiences, but you just have to do bake lighting. So I think lighting is the issue, Dan, as opposed to are the assets there with PBR and GLTF format and all, yes, they are there today. It's lighting is an issue in the player, so you have to bake some lighting, but photography replacement, real-time configurators are also getting there to a point where it's extremely photorealistic. And um, I, I, I wouldn't say that a year ago, but I can say now, the quality is there today, and we just need to get more customers to see it and accept it and convert the 2D web to this 2.5 web <laughs> yeah. before you do 3D and with headsets, but it's there today. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, it also makes me think of some, you know, technology Dan was showing us at our last face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, NERF is kind of a general broad term for describing it, but, but Dan, what do you think of this kind of, you know, future space of... Uh, basically, you know, imagery that's kind of computer generated or, you know, machine learning generated, let's say, um, but add some photorealism that you might not get from a normal triangular based mesh. Can yeah. you share some thoughts? Yeah, of course. Um, so with neural radiance field technology, which is like you just basically do on a normal mobile phone, you don't need any specialized equipment or like massive big rigs to set it up with. I did a talk last year here about that. Um, we see like a really high fidelity and accuracy of RGB. So basically it's imagery that's like mapped around and creates a 3D representation of an object. So, you know, we've got it to a point now where that you can take a photo with your regular mobile phone and get an identical replica in AR or in a browser straight away. Um, in order, but a lot of the clients we're working with really want to have 3D meshes as well, because a lot of companies have built an infrastructure around 3D. Mm -hmm. They've got an AR planner, they've got a room planner, they've got yeah. different ways meshes of they probably aren't going away. Exactly. Soon, so so we've had to kind it. of change yeah. our direction a little bit to focus a lot of our energy on mesh generation, which is actually a much more complicated topic. So it's almost like you're going backwards <laughs> a little bit. You can go back to the future. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, if 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 the world could embrace like technologies like NERF and AI and machine learning and implicit representations, then you could actually get really accurate representations. But to Amra's point, 
that's reading in RGB data. It's not really bringing in lighting. And at the moment, you can't, you could scan a product outside in the hall, but it will look like it belongs in the hall. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. went through it outside, it wouldn't look like it belongs. So that's where it's got to evolve. So I think AI and machine learning is really important. I think that it needs to do a lot of evolution. That's a bit of a weird thing to say about AI, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But I think it needs to become a complement to a photo real high quality experience that can be used in lots of different places rather than a replacer, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. I a, you want to, yeah, and just to add thought. to your point, so I was big on LiDAR when we started all 3D. I was like, okay, we're gonna spend this money building this LiDAR app on iPhones. And I was pitching that to, for fundraising and the whole lot. We had an app, we gave it to some of our customers. It's still, the scanning is good, but still there's issues. You have holes in them, then you have to mm -hmm. figure out AI to fill the holes, then to separate the lighting situation, and it has to be the exact lighting. So we just sort of said, okay, we can park that. That's not gonna generate revenue for us. So let's go to mesh <laughs> yeah. building yeah. and figure yeah. out materials yeah. and you can swap the materials. So I think for us, and I think in your case too, it's revenue that's driving going back yeah. Yeah. as yeah. opposed to the new technologies. Because today for 2D web, the quality level is just so exceptionally needs to be photorealistic and exact that the use case is not there, mm -hmm. but you know, it'll get there. Yeah. Sorry, one, one more thing. Great. Like the, the, the frustration is, though, that when, like, for example, we've scanned things like plants or really highly complicated things like furry teddy bears, it's beyond photo real. I mean, it is, it's identical. And we know there's an ROI when customers see an object and they can spin it around, zoom in and out, compared to just seeing a static image. But it requires a different kind of mindset. And there's been a lot of companies still getting adapting to 3D as a technology, yes. let alone neural radiance yeah. or AI developing 3D interaction. So that's been the journey, I think. It's been the challenge. And I think thanks to Chat GPT, people are realizing that these images are being generated that are synthetic. So mm -hmm. we have been generating synthetic images <laughs> yeah. since yeah. whatever. But, but with our synthetic images, they represent actual objects, not statistically created objects, which may never match your exact object. So I think that's, that's something I think will change the mindset moving forward as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But, you know, just the last quick thought on, you know, AI and, you know, it's interesting. Emmett um, from Google the other day was giving a talk and I liked how he phrased it that, you know, you can hallucinate these really complex, interesting 3D scenes and products. But if you try to hallucinate a, with AI um, a real product, you know, you're going to run into trouble when the customer exactly. gets the product. It shows up on their door and all of a sudden you got a return on your hand because it's just not realistic. It's, you know, invented. Yeah. Um, but Ashley, I did want to ask you about, you know, 3D scanning and kind of as we're continuing this discussion for clothing, do you find that that's a good approach or is it better to go from, you know, the clo browse wear style where it's actually being, you know, invented and designed taking that 3D or is it better to get the real thing and then talk, like scan it and bring it in? Yeah, I mean, we, we work with people who like design for manufacturing. So I would definitely say using a clo or browsewear if it's apparel, key shop moto for footwear, um, you know, there's a bunch of different programs out there. But what we do suggest is building out your material library. So there are um, some amazing fabric scanners out there so that you can scan your fabric and so that it's not Versace, it's the other V company. I really work in fashion, I promise. Um, <laughs> Valentino Red. Valentino Red is a very specific red, uh, and so that needs to be exactly correct, and everyone in that organization should have the exact red, right? So mm -hmm. making sure that you know big enterprises build out their shared material library, and they're using scanners to do that, and adding in the physics into Clo and Browser, so then designers are designing with the proper fabrics to start with. So it's the answer is kind of both. Yeah, uh, which no, is I, like that. I think it's kind of the best of both worlds yeah. where you've got maybe the interactivity that the you know design software might be able to expose, you know, different material, you know, tension or whatever, the mm -hmm. fabric stiffness. Um, but then you're dealing with realistic looking materials that can get applied. So yeah, yeah, it's a nice approach. Yeah, and if you can't afford that and you're smaller, you know, Adobe Substance is amazing and yeah. it's all ready for real time, so. Yeah, I think to add to that as well, I think you've got to, you've got to really focus on centralizing your repository. 
right? Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of companies will build a 3D asset for AR, then they'll build one for VR, and they'll build one for different re examples, and it's a really complicated ecosystem. But actually, if you start to try and centralize and work sort of almost top down, you know, so you build a complicated asset and then you can decimate that and apply that same thinking to materials, it makes a huge difference. It makes like the material library, mm -hmm. if you're scanning in really high res with as much tech as you can to get it as perfect as possible, then it makes everything else easier. I think historically a lot of people have kind of worked backwards where you build textures for real time. But then when suddenly the real time evolves and the GPUs and everything yeah. evolves, you suddenly got to do it all again, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. So it's quite smart to work that way down. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, oh, go ahead. And like, just to add to your point, we have sellers like, you know, uh, annual revenue of 5 million. Even they're learning that they need to develop their own materials. Yeah. And once they have the material library, they can actually then just change all their products and add those over time. And it's cheaper for them, faster for them, and it's just, it's, I think the world's changing right now. It doesn't yeah. matter that you're the big gorilla in retail. It's also the small sellers or suppliers, whatever you want to call it. They have now, thanks to Wayfair, by the way, <laughs> and they, they have figured out that they need to invest and yeah. do it that way. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And I want to kind of stay on a similar thread when we talk about material libraries, um, thinking about like asset libraries and building out your you know, content strategy. Um, you know, that's been a challenge for a while is, you know, how do you do this at scale? If you're a retailer and you're looking into building these experiences for customers, um, you know, just limiting it to a small number of things is a challenge. Um, and I'm curious as kind of whoever wants to answer first, but like, what's a good strategy to, you know, go from that small number of products where you ran a pilot perhaps and you were successful with your engagement, but now you need to digitize hundreds of thousands uh, of assets. You know, what, what strategies do you guys like to use to, to get there? And anyone who wants to take it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, um, we work with people who are, are designing in 3D in-house, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have the bandwidth to design everything. So, um, you know, some of our clients, they, they might have 25% of their library in 3D they're doing in-house, and then, you know, we'll, we'll tend to recommend uh, other 3D artist shops or studios to, like, help supplement that. Um, but I think the core is making sure you have like that scalable content management system to reuse those assets and repurpose and edit them. So you're not recreating things for every end use case. So mm -hmm. um, to your point, you know, we always say build that highest level asset and then, you know, we automatically optimize and convert to whatever, you know, Snapchat, Meta, Google search specs, wherever you're trying to go um, is just more scalable. So for us, it's when we engage with a new customer, um, a seller, usually they want to cr create their best sellers in 3D. And yeah. so we usually go with that, that uh -huh. point or new products that they're introducing to the market. So we start with that. So we don't tell them how, you know, you should digitize all your existing catalog of products because that's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. We don't have the bandwidth, neither do they, ha they have the time to do it. Yeah. So then we break it down into chunks of saying, you know, how you do it, well, how many first, Break the year into four quarters and go, let's do these. Like find and a category them. Exactly. or a product line. Yeah. And that's what we do, and that's how we get them engaged, get them to see the ROI as they're seeing more imagery across all their distribution channels and they see how you know, their revenue is increasing. Again, I think someone mentioned that it's not about cost saving. It's about using that asset in infinitely different ways that you can and then getting more revenue for that asset in different ways than when you're exposing it to end consumers. And I think that flows, and that way, whether it's you're a small um, supplier or a large, we, we work with you, we build your own plan, and we actually help them how they're gonna digitize or 3 eyes their entire catalog. Mm -hmm. And that, that means a lot of customer success people in the team, but that's how we do it. And we have some people who have digitized their entire catalog, especially the five million one that I told you about. Yeah. We did all her catalog in the first year, but now she's come back because she wants to change them and she wants to create more content for social media. So she just wants nice. to get feedback from, and this person's crazy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> She's all the time building assets and more variants and trying them out on social media to then build it to manufacture. So I think that's how we usually work with our, our customers, be partners with them. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I think, you know, for a customer to see the ROI, it makes them more willing to kind of continue to invest and scale up, but you know, it's an interesting challenge, you know, from a creation space, but 
Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to add that I, you just touched on it as well. That I mean, obviously, your top sellers, your ROI items that have the biggest impact because 3D does make an impact. The numbers are there. It, it, when you see interaction in either AR or in a window in a browser, there is a revenue increase. There's an interaction increase. So, but I, we we see, and I know from my experience as well that. A lot of people really want to be able to have configuration, instant configuration, and that's a huge thing. So it's all well and good to focus on a product, but actually quite often the ROI really comes in if you've got something like a sofa that's got 30 different fabrics. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we had a conversation with someone recently who was saying that it's all well and good to have this really lovely sofa, but where I will see what my customers want is to well see that in yellow, orange, leather, tan, you know, lots of different types of fabric. But... You can actually do that quite simply by just swapping materials out. And that's one of, one of the great things about PBR as an example is you can just get really good looking assets, really good looking materials and swap them in and out of configurator. But there's a huge ROI. I know that when I was in Ikea, for example, like for like photograph of a, of a product versus a 3D of a product isn't really a massive cost saving if it's one on one, if mm -hmm. you're going for really high fidelity. But suddenly when you can do all the other materials, suddenly the ROI just goes through the roof. Yeah, we just launched uh, our client YKK. See the zipper? Probably you know, have them on you. Uh, but they, it was a more B2B use case of that, which is interesting. So like Nike goes to design their custom zipper and they're flipping through catalogs and pointing at different images, and it's crazy. Like, and, and they couldn't see it in real time in 3D. And then once they chose all their options, they didn't even know the order code to, <laughs> to tell them, right? But now they've tied their 3D models. It's, it's like online configurator, and it's tied directly to their PLM system. So the minute that Nike designer, whoever chooses all their options, they see their real-time zipper, they get the real-time order code, and they can make the order. So that month-long process became two days yeah. and so they can make it sell faster and like it's it's in that like b2b sale as well yeah yeah no yeah, that's a good point it's not always about the cons end consumer you know there's some opportunities internally in the design process and you know just efficiency that you can have by having a 3d workflow through and through from the design to you know the photography the pre-production you know the approvals the marketing photos etc the more you can leverage your 3d content you know the better off you're going to be um, and just looking at time, I know we want to have some audience questions, but I think we'll do maybe 10 more minutes of this kind of discussion and then open it up to the audience. Um, there's one more topic, uh, you know, that I specifically wanted to cover uh, and also just make a plug for our Cronus room upstairs. We're going to be hosting uh, a number of talks, including some this afternoon, uh, that kind of di deep dive into some of this technology and thinking about ways that you can incorporate, you know, some of the new, you know, PBR next features, um, but also just thinking about what's coming next. And that's kind of the topic that I wanted to dive into a little bit here. Um, you know, there's a, a format. In fact, we're going to be showing a demo later up in the Kronos room um, that we're currently calling GLXF. Um, so GLTF is kind of the main 3D single model format um, that you're all used to and that's pretty widely supported. GLXF is, um, you know, you can think of it more like a scene of 3D content. So not just a single model, but perhaps how you're bringing multiple products together. And as we've been talking about this in the, you know, the Kronos group internally and needs for 3D commerce, um, there are a lot of interesting use cases that you can start bringing in products that don't necessarily originate in the same space. You know, right now there's a lot of tools where within a given ecosystem, you know, whether it's Wayfair or Target or whatever, you have a configurator, you can pull in products from that company. But what we're expecting is consumers are going to want to be able to shop around, just like they do in the real world, and bring those products together. And then you start to run into considerations around, well, what should the lighting be? You know, it's a, it's a product that has a, a light bulb in it. Should that be casting light on the other products? And if, you know, the hero shot and the website for this particular product is in a certain, you know, bright outdoor light, but now all of a sudden we're bringing it inside with some other softer pillows or whatever, how do those live together? And so I'm going to pose that as a, whoever wants to take this first question, but how do we kind of, um, you know, think about scenes? So I, I will... I, will, I, I don't know how to do across different retailers, so that's a, that's a big challenge. But um, at least um, our platform at All3D, we, the reason why our customers love us, because we have what we call a scene creator, where you can build environments, and they're actually, and it's browser-based. So everything is using GLB assets, and even the scenes are GLB. 
and then all the products that they bring into, you know, from library or stores or whatever, which of course we have to make sure that the assets can, we can ingest them and then convert them to GLB, really low res because it's on a browser. Mm -hmm. Then they can manipulate it and, and do whatever they need to do in their scenes and create outputs, which are 360s. It's, it's in real time, but then we, we, we take it back because it has to work on the web. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's interesting. That's a big issue because some of the assets that come into our libraries are not created by us. They're created by, from other vendors or other people who built it. There's always an issue with conversion, but we end up getting it to the lowest common denominator to make it look good. So mm -hmm. we're doing that today, and it's all GLB, GLTF-based, browser-based to do the scenes. And then the user can print out whatever resolution they want the output. Some even print out so they can put it on a truck outside. They can hang it you know, in posters and catalogs. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. And so I think the technology is there, but with LGL, XF, you know, and, and <laughs> there are too many acronyms yeah. for me. <laughs> I have my brain to remember. Doing a cross and giving that ability for the consumer to do it, I think we can get there maybe in the next five years, but, but we're already on the path. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's really needed, so I'm very excited about this. And, uh, you know, I know we've heard a lot of furniture examples, but jewelry, like, the trend right now is stackable rings and stackable bracelets and, and all the inner, like, the, the 10 earrings on your ears. And so we, we get this question a lot from jewelers. Um, so that there's a lot of use cases apart from furniture where you need multiple 3D assets together. Yeah. 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 Quickly, before you jump oh. in, Dan, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to, uh, to Patrick. I think he was here earlier. Uh, but he's been doing some amazing work on wearables and anchor points and that skeletal facial anchoring. And so that's another interesting hot topic that we're thinking about, you know, as you mentioned, the jewelry and, you know, just the different attachment points. Uh, it's an interesting consideration. The more we've been, like, diving into it, the more apparent it is that the industry's in a lot of different directions right now, where you get, you know, motion capture for, for films or video games, and then you have, you know, hand tracking for, you know, VR or face tracking for, you know, Snap or iOS. And, you know, everyone has their own, you know, anchor point. So anyway, that's a fascinating conversation that's happening upstairs in the uh, Kronos room. So I'm going to just go back to Dan and let you finish up on the GLXF <laughs> stuff. Well, good, good promotion for Kronos. Good work, Mike. Um, yeah, the, the, the GLXF thing came out of the basis of, well, three, so, so just to explain to everyone, 3D Commerce said they needed a use case for complex scenes and a simple way of, like, building complex scenes using GLTF as a file format. And then there was a conversation about USD and there was lots of different groups who were looking into it. And then there was a need for interactivity of how to make that interaction work. And of course, the GLTF is a, is a file format, but GLXF kind of just brings those formats together. And it'd be quite interesting to see actual testing of those use cases for GLXF because I think the business use cases are there straight away. You know, like you've yeah, both been we saying. We have it. That's the biggest selling thing with us exactly. is scenes and products yeah. in the scenes. But, but how that comes together and how that's yeah. lit and how those shaders work, I think that's going to be the bit we're going to go, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> because, like, when you put in a GLTF file from, I don't know, from anybody and then put it in another one, it will be just lit differently. I know in years when I've built models and put PBRs on things, and you put an HDR around it, it looks fantastic on its own. Yes. Then yeah. suddenly you'll see that in a scene with 20 other assets. You're going to be like, Ugh, my color's wrong. Back to yeah. your point, Ashley, about the red having to be spot on yeah. in a GLX file, GLXF file. That's going to be hard to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when we, it's going to take a little while to get that nailed, I think. And yeah. just to add to your point, so our customers... One thing is, we are B2B companies, so our customers are sellers. So, you know, when they create a model, it's a neutral lighting. They want images in certain lighting. Now, now they put it in scene with other products. Of course, when the image comes out, the, the, their product does not look exactly like a silo, you know, <laughs> because mm -hmm. there is light reflecting from other materials. There's lighting. So then they want us to color correct it. So we, now we're doing using AI to color correct and match their... But they're faking what should be in a realistic environment that it's <laughs> yeah. not going to look like because they think it's because it's going to have a high return rate because the color doesn't but that's what customers want and, and sometimes you give it yes to and maybe there's another thing as well a little controversial thing maybe is i think a lot of people you speak to as well who aren't necessarily in the industry don't necessarily understand the difference between a rendered image and a real-time asset. Exactly. Absolutely. And the problem is, yeah. quite often they go, well, that's how my photo looks. I want it to look like yeah. that. And you're like, yeah, that's pretty hard. And then when you put it in like a GLXF file, it's going to be even harder to do. 
And so that's a really fine balance of educating and making people understand the technology around them. And of course, it will get better and better and better, but mm. there's still a misunderstanding in the industry in a whole that I think that people see a rendered photo of something and then they see a real-time asset. It's not the same thing and technology is different. It's hard to educate people around that. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, terminology out there is a little bit confused sometimes for, for customers, you know, when we're working with clients that haven't done 3D before, you know, you tell them we're going to make 3D content, um, they might think of like a 360 spinner or, exactly. you know, something more static um, because they've seen the term 3D used for that or that's in their mind what you're going to get. And they don't realize it's potentially interactive or, you know, you can change the things around or you can mix and match or customize. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of power there, but, you know, education still has to happen. Um, and another, you know, Kronos plug, we're doing some, you know, business <laughs> development work um, to try to educate, you know, consumers out there. And Jatinder and I were talking earlier about, you know, this particular conference isn't particularly focused on e-commerce in general, right? You see a lot of headsets and a lot of emerging tech. Um, so it's interesting and fun for me, you know, as a kind of futurist to come and see all this crazy stuff and think like, yeah, this is our future. But in reality, when you go back to talk to a client, they're still living in the, I need to put stuff and sell it on the internet. Exactly. And how do I do that? Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. there's a disconnect. And I think, you know, part of our mission is to educate the consumers, educate the, you know, businesses and start, you know, showing more of this type of content and say, you know what? 3D, you know, can look really good. It can look photorealistic. And, you know, these are the tools that, you know, we're providing as a group and we're working on as an industry to bridge that gap and, and make it, you know, so eventually you get to a point where people are going to be, you know, wearing their glasses and not sure what's real. They're going to, you know, before they sit down in any chair, you're going to have to double check that it's really there. Yeah. Right. So we're getting there, but, um, you know, <laughs> Very cool. All right, so I do want to make sure we have some time for the audience to ask any uh, questions that might be on their mind. And uh, there's a microphone in the middle. If uh, step right up if you're interested. Go on, Jatinda. 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 Oh, <laughs> I'll actually help you out and uh, just walk the microphone around for you guys. Oh, great. Oh, okay. Just, just walking. Walking. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's a good call. Yeah, this is a question like I get every day. Yes. And I'm going to ask you as well. Yes. <laughs> and I think it's important for the audience as well. So how do we track this ROI for these? I mean, it's like a catch-22 situation because we all go to the customers and then they say how the ROI, what the ROI is. Then the number of 3D assets, which are the larger pool, is not even 1% of that. Mm -hmm. So based on that 1%, sample, you cannot say that it gets a 200% or let's say 30%. So we are in a kind of a catch-22 situation. So unless and until there is not enough uh, data for 3D, we cannot have a substantial numbers which we can say to consumers and retailers. Mm -hmm. And unless and until they don't move, we don't have the numbers. I mean, uh, I mean this is like question. a question. Yeah. I get it. So, so, so we, we measure in a few different ways, but I think that you starting out, we ask, you know, what are the KPIs of your management? Like, what is that goal? Right? So if it is, you know, I, I want 3D because I want to sell more in e-commerce. Okay. Well, well, in order to do that, like, yes, you're probably only doing 1%, but how are we going to measure and making sure that the, the systems are set up to track that and that we're doing this over time? Um, so, you know, when, when we launch 3D, we track everything so we know where that 3D model is, if you're using our viewer, where it's going. And then we push them and say, okay, well, it shouldn't just be on e-commerce. We can publish that 3D model to Google search. So, so when people search, um, you know, not ever, it's only in North America right now. Google's continuing to expand, but you're creating that omni-channel 3D experience. Um, and we can publish that 3D on a your Amazon storefront too. So, so it's everywhere and it's not buried in your website. Or, um, you know, we had a different client who's, you know, the, their manufacturer increased the price of their samples. And this was a huge pain point for their management because all of a sudden it was a 25% higher cost than they were planning. So it's like, okay, well, we know that cost. So what if we could create this many 3D models and you're not replacing those samples and the cost for 3D models is X and the cost for these samples is Y. So we're clearly showing that cost savings difference. But yeah, it's, it's, it's digging deeper and asking those questions of like, why, do you, why are you wanting 3D right now? What, it, what changed in your business today to make you call me? Like, you know, and like pushing on that because it, it's not just a shiny object. Like, 
yeah, there's that reason in making sure you have those systems set up and connected to, to track that data. So, so Jitinder, my answer is very simple. Usually our customers, we say to them, it actually comes back to scenes and environments. So you may, the 3D model with a chair, who cares if it's 3D or it's not? You know what I mean? No one cares. You can take photos from your phone and you know sell all the angles and, and do Photoshop and do it. But what you want to do, say to them is you want to show that chair in different environments and different settings with other products because it's all about other products around it. Your conversion of that chair goes up and they buy other products from you. So that's one use case. And if you show them in different environments, which would represent all your market segments of customers, you know, value-based customer, high-end customer, if you show it in different environments, it will sell because your product will look so good in these environments that your customer needs to engage with those. That increases your revenue, increase your marketing. You can't do it if you're just a chair and you have a model and you take photos from you. You just physically cannot do it. Maybe Photoshop or use generative AI to show it in random things or whatever, which doesn't look good. So that's the use case. Plus, when they sell on retailer website, you know how retailers work? If you sell that chair on Amazon, now you sell that on um, Target, or you sell, used to sell it on Bed Bath & Beyond. It's the same image that is going across all retailers. Now, if you create, put the model, and you put them in different environments, and you sell across different retailers, the consumer is not, when they do dynamic pricing and search for the lowest cost, they will automatically gravitate towards the ones that you know, look similar to what they want. They will go to that and buy it. So dynamic pricing and race to the bottoms through retailers also goes away when you show different versions of your product in different environments. And then you can also configure that chair into different materials for each retailer, it's different. And that is the selling point that now these guys understand because it, at, eventually Wayfair is gonna say, this person, we're gonna charge back returns to you. The seller, you know, manufacturer or supplier loses. And so they don't want the retailers to lower the pricing down all the way. So that's how they win. So yeah, yeah saying conversion goes up by 50% to 200% to 300%, those numbers don't mean anything to anyone. It just doesn't. Just really yeah, quickly, yeah. sorry, I won't yeah. take too much time. Uh, the, um, a little minor Kronos plug, uh, something we discussed in commerce recently was actually doing statistics and analysis of that ROI. Where is GLTF used? Where are PBRs used? Where are the extensions used? Who's using it? And what's the benefit of doing that? Because we develop it, we evolve it, but we don't really know what's being used more than others. So for example, clear coat or whatever in PBR, what's the, in how much is that being used? So there is actually a drive, an initiative in Kronos in formats and commerce right now to look at the statistics and do an analysis. And we're lucky we've got a lot of really good companies involved in that and they're kind of sharing some numbers that they say, hey, when people interact with this kind of product, we see this kind of interaction and this kind of time. So my point is it's a very pressing question that everyone wants to know right now. We all know that there's an ROI and it's worth doing it because <laughs> that's what we do, but people actually would like to understand those numbers as well. But there are no clear yeah, numbers. Not. There is no, no one has any. To sell a product online, you have to have, you know, some way of visualizing it. And that's what you have to say. The experience is going to mo move from store to online and online back to your home. You're going to shop from your home and you want to be able to see that object in your home. AR, real time. But that's not today. It will be in the next five to six years. Nice. Uh, any other audience questions? Do, wanna... Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yeah, up, up, over this way. We'll get the, the mic to you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so how to actually, like, what is the way towards the photorealism? Like, uh, how exactly the materials uh, can be made better or changes in lighting? Where is the industry progressing? Take that. I mean, I can, I can start that off, yeah, I suppose, and if you guys want to jump into it. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting. So, you know, the PBR Next that we've been seeing, you know, some of the demos and the videos start bringing in additional kind of material properties, right? Uh, traditional, like, PBR, like, physically-based rendering is a, you know, real-time strategy to kind of fake the lighting that you might be able to bake in a, a, a path-traced, you know, way of doing things. And path-tracing, you know, these days, it's already, you know, basically 100% physically accurate. You can replicate any photo 
So that's kind of done and solved. The challenge is that disconnect between doing it in real time and getting the same level of, of quality and detail. So a lot of the extensions that have been added to you know, GLTF support now, you know, where you can actually use those is still what we're trying to you know, promote and push out there. Not every GLTF viewer can take advantage of all the extensions that might add things like you know, transmission or index of refraction, but some of them do. And we're trying to push on getting more of those out there and more of those examples that have the you know, kind of advanced material properties um, like there's some pretty cool like velvet sofas, for example, that you know traditionally you couldn't do with just you know a normal map and a roughness map that you might have in your normal workflow. Uh, but if you start adding some of these new things, um, new maps essentially, and the, the rendering engine understands that because it's in the extension from uh, you know the GLTF spec, then all of a sudden you start having these you know more advanced looking products that start to look more and more realistic. There are still some limitations. We can't really do fur right now. And, you know, it's not perfect, but, you know, the technology continues to get better and better. And, you know, maybe it's Nerf, like you were saying, Dan, for some of this stuff. Like, you can pick up, like, weird little, you know, I've seen some, like, flowers and stuff that he was showing us. And you get, like, all the little petals and stuff. But mm -hmm. it would be really hard to do with, like, a triangulated mesh. So, I don't know, meshes maybe only take us so far, and then some of these extra details are, maybe they're hallucinated by AI in mm -hmm. real time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyone else want to add to that? Well, I, actually, I think Ash, we need to hear from Ashley because the apparel fashion sector is the industry that I think I have the hugest amount of respect for to try and achieve this because cloth and textile and weave is everything in that industry. And we can do a sofa and we can make a sofa look really good and it can look like a felt sofa. Have you sofa done boucle <laughs> on a sofa? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah. And, and I think it goes back to, look, like we're, we're getting there, right? I think it's important... I really do to use a Chrono certified viewer because like if you're if you're not you're comparing apples to oranges with with what's supported and different lighting right so I think the fact that we have the standard viewer is really important um, lighting is essential and the more extensions you use the more real you can get but again like what is that use case at the end of the day like for me I am not a decorator and I had to like put tape on my floor to see if the size of that table because I kept ordering tables and they look like doll tables they're way too small <laughs> compared to my couch but like AR true to size would really help me there and I don't care I can look at the photos on the website and see what that table looks like but just the size would be really helpful so what is that use case and what is the value you're bringing to that consumer in that experience so I don't think everything has to be truly photorealistic for an interactive 3D AR experience to help a consumer make a purchase. Yes, we want to get there, um, but yeah. Ashley, I agree with you. There are two things where returns are done, dimensions yeah. and actually color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get the color as photorealistic or the material looking even on a sofa, the return rates are very high. And, 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 and Mike knows what happens because shipping yeah. cost in, on products, home products is very high. And so that's why you have to get both of them accurate. But I agree with you. An AR model is actually getting pretty good. One product by itself is very photorealistic today. That you can view it in your room. But that's eventually you want to put a headset and you want to be able to walk around, not look from your phone. Cool. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's where, that is where 3D will really shine. And I just don't know where, where that is. Yeah. When, when we made IKEA Place, um, it, it, it was... Um, it, Everyone just loved the fact of like, throwing multiple products into their room space, seeing what sofa would fit into an alcove or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that was really good. And it created a lot of great PR for IKEA and everything. But it was, if there was a genuine use case for it, people then felt confident and committed that when they went to the store and bought that product, that it would fit. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of work that went in to make sure the accuracy was there. And again, mm -hmm. it comes back to the thing we said earlier about having that centralized repository, because when we started on that, we made sure we worked from the source products, you see, so that we knew the accuracy and the detailing was really there and the dimensions were spot on. So we had faith that those assets would be okay. What we never took account for was the fact that people didn't know AR and people didn't know how to use the app. Yes, exactly. So when they, they placed it, it would be yeah. above the ground exactly. or it would be it further off exactly. when yeah. they thought it wasn't going to, no, it doesn't fit. Exactly. No, it does fit, it's just that you haven't placed it right and that yeah. was a challenge. Interesting. Well, and then, yeah. interestingly enough, Pottery Barn did the same thing where they actually designed products together and said you could put it on yeah. your in your room and Drop see them all. Yeah. yeah, and people could not use it either. They could mm -hmm. not figure that out. <laughs>
You guys are interface. so awesome. We have time for about one, one more question. More question. Yeah. Two <laughs> quick questions, but here's this gentleman that has a question for you. Yeah, just really quickly. So um, I've seen, um, I, I guess the viewing experience can vary uh, differently depending on the browser, the device, the store that you're at. And I think I just heard uh, Ashley mention that there is a Kronos viewer. I guess, can you comment on that? The, the, the experience right now seems to be a little bit all over the place depending on these variables. Is there a way to, to drive towards a standard so that, so that people can get the most out of these models? Yeah, so um, you can, if you've built your own 3D viewer, you can submit it to Kronos to get Kronos certified. Um, and you can go on the, the Kronos website and see what, what you do for certification. So Ventana, we did that. Um, and I will tell you, like, it actually got us a client. Like, we had someone inbound from our website. They saw that we had a Kronos certified viewer. And on our sales call, they were like, yep, that's why we wanted you, which, like, just we're trying to sell. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely right. The certification program in 3D Commerce around the viewers was really, really good. Yeah. Um, and if you think about what something we touched on before about multiple GLTF files from different sources, if your viewer is certified, you know it's not the viewer that's the problem. You know that there's the, the textures and the materials and the models that have come yeah. in can be built and authored in different ways. So the certification program is very good, I think. I agree. I think Kronos is the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Our last question of the day. So it's a semi-related question. Uh, Amra, you mentioned uh, nailing color. And question, even if you nail the color right, how do you guys handle the color actually appearing differently on the consumer device, whether it's an iPhone versus Android mm -hmm. versus all the different you kinds of You are so laptops? right. Yeah. It's still a problem because you, it's, it's not the same across different devices. And that is a big problem. And returns will always happen. And there's no way you can do it. But it's reducing the return rate is the main thing. That I do it all the time. If I buy a dress and I buy, you know, and the color's not the same, my biggest return is the color's not the same as what I see in the photo. And 50% return rate in my case, so I would be the worst possible consumer. But yeah. <laughs> And I, I say as well, like, we're lucky that we have Google, a very active participant in PBR and all the different certifications and everything else that we do, because that's, I don't want to be controversial, that's probably the most used search engine out there. So, and they make sure that works the same way consistently across lots of different devices, a lot of GPUs, a lot of CPUs, a lot of different technologies. And that actually really helps. So then we at least we know that when you do look at a GLTF file on a browser, it should be pretty good. It should be pretty consistent. Yeah. yeah, it can be a problem, of course. And I just add in there too, like, you know, this has been a challenge for devices kind of since we've been looking exactly. at like computer screens, right? Like, you know, yeah. if you're producing a film, you've got, you know, the little dark window with the screen that's perfectly calibrated, you know? And so I think at the end of the day, it's about the consistency of the content that you're viewing in comparison. So when we do this like multi-scene, for example, and you're seeing a whole scene come together, your brain's kind of imagining the colors, how they complement each other. And I think that's the most important thing to the consumer, especially if they're planning like, you know, a, a new space or a whole outfit with multiple pieces that would complement themselves. <laughs> um, seeing how things compare relative to each other, I think is more important than how the, you know, pixels on your phone compare exactly one-to-one -one with what your eyes see, just because we can't, you know, perception is just different than, you know, whatever you're going to see on the screen. And, and there, sorry, just one more thing. There, there is also a bit of an issue that if someone's authored a GLTF file with all the PBR extensions, like clear code or whatever, and the engine hasn't got those capabilities, then of course it's going to look different. So it's a whole minefield, not only of platform, operating system, device hardware and everything, but it's also, again, the, the asset might have been authored perfectly, but if the engine can't support it, so it's, it's really hard to nail down perfectly. But I think we're seeing really big improvements, right? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to thank the audience and thank our panelists. Uh, one more round of applause.